There we go. All right, we are on chapter 15 now today from the screw tape letters. Excuse me, did you say 15 or 16? 15. Yeah, we're on 1-5. Yep, 15. That's what we're. I have a better hearing aid. Okay, well, that's just I fine. Don't hear soft, soft, so. I'll do my best. 16. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do my best then. All right. Um, so yeah, we're on chapter 15. Does anybody have any thoughts or reflections about chapter 15 as they read it? Time, yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's kind of the, the overarching theme in this chapter is, is time and how we live in it. We can talk more about that as we go. Any other? Samantha apparently has something to say, but not able to make it out. So. Jesus wants us to live with philosophy and this moment in time. Yeah. Where we make the greatest impact yeah. in this moment. And the devil wants us to live in the future with all of its fears and anxieties and whatever. Yeah, there's this, there, there, yeah that's, that, that summarizes the whole chapter, I think, pretty well. That there's, there's, there's what, how Jesus would have us live, and we'll see this in just a second which is um, with living with our mind focused on eternity. And we'll he'll talk about specifically what that means here in a second, but also on the present moment. And the devil would have us do the exact opposite of that. And it, there's two alternatives suggested here in the chapter. One very briefly is to have us live in the past, but then he would much, much better than that, the devil would prefer us to try to live in the future, right? As if we're always always focused on what might come next or something like that. But we'll, we'll talk about these things uh, as we go. Any other observations or anything? Okay, well then let's, uh, let's just dive right into it. So this is starting on page 75, the very beginning of the chapter, first paragraph. Screw tape says, I had noticed, of course, that the humans were having a lull in their European war what they naively call the war, and am not surprised that there is a corresponding lull in the patient's anxieties. Do we want to encourage this or keep him worried? That's kind of the, the, the question that starts out this chapter here. Before we get into that specifically, though, just a note here about this thing, you know, about, about the war. Uh, you know, he says what they naively call the war. You know, remember this is being written... Or the, the, these events are taking place in about the 1940s somewhere. They're talking about what we call World War II usually. But uh, what screw tape, the point that screw tape is making here is, you know, we human beings have this tendency to call whatever we're in the middle of the whatever, you know? So in, in, at that time it was the war, you know? Or right now it's, we call COVID-19 the virus, right? as if there is no other one or something like that. Of course there is, there's plenty of other ones. Um, and what the, the point that screw tape is making here is that while these human beings are so focused on this particular war, there is actually another war. And that's the war that screw tape and Wormwood are engaged in, the war between the spiritual forces of evil and, and what Jesus is doing for and through his people, right? And you have these two forces. This is, this is the real war. This is what this whole book is trying to help us to see is this real struggle, this war that's going on all around us that we're often um, completely unaware of. So he says they naively call their European war the war when there is actually a much bigger war going on. So that's the, the first point here. But then screw tape and Wormwood are also discussing the fact that apparently at whatever point this is during World War II, there's kind of a lull in the war Right? Not much going on right now. And as a result, the patient, the man they're working on here, um, has kind of had a, a lull in his worry. He's not as worried about the war and all of that as he had been because it's kind of slowed down uh, for the time being. And so the question they're wrestling with is, well, do we leave him like that, where he's kind of comfortable and not so worried and just let him live in that for the moment? Or do we try to get him out of that? And that's the question that's going to kind of frame this whole chapter here. Any thoughts or questions about that? Okay. So the, it becomes then a question of time. 
and this is what we, we talked about already. Screw tape is going to talk about whether they want to leave the patient living in the present, in that moment when there's a lull in the war and he's maybe a little less worried than he otherwise would be. Or do we want to try and get him living in the future or in the past or something like that? And that'll all come up here as we go. But this is, we got to build to that first here. And this is the next quote I have here is on page 75, the, the second paragraph. He says, the humans live in time, but our enemy destines them. And remember the enemy is Jesus. So Jesus destines them to eternity. He, therefore, I believe, wants them to attend chiefly to two things, to eternity itself and to that point, uh, and, and to that point of time, it shouldn't say of them, it should say that point of time, which they call the present. So he says humans live in time, but our enemy destines them to live in eternity. What do you think he means by that? Good idea, Samantha. <laughs> Anybody else? What do, you, what do you think he means? Humans live in time, but our enemy destines them to live in eternity. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, we'll, 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 get, we'll get to some of that in a minute, but the, the, the time thing, and I think this is especially true for people in our culture, in our part of the world, time isn't, for us, time is an absolute, right? We have, uh, we've, uh, although this just reminds me, I have not changed my watch yet. <laughs> my, watch is an, my watch is an hour behind, but for us, time is an absolute. We have these things, you know, and, and on my computer and on my phone, there's everything's got a clock on it to tell me absolutely what time it is and everything is governed and ruled by time. So it's really difficult for us to imagine an existence without time, okay? But if you think back to the story of creation in the Bible, okay? God making the world in six days. What's the very first thing that God made? Anybody remember? Well, yeah, God, on the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And then he says, let there be light, right? Light is the very first thing, okay? And then it's not until two days later on the third day of creation that God actually makes the sun and the moon and the stars, right? I, I try and get, uh, just recently, I went over this with some confirmation kids and I tried to get them to understand what I was saying. And I think it was probably a little over their head. So if I'm talking over your head, don't, you're not alone. It's, it's what I do. But think about this for a second. So if God waited until the third day to create the sun, the moon and the stars and had already before that created light, the sun and the moon and the stars didn't, God didn't make them then in order to, create light. Light already existed. God created the sun, the moon, and the stars to create time, right? And that's what it actually says. If you read it in Genesis chapter one, it says, God says, let there be, let there be the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, the sun and the moon, and let them be as signs for days and seasons and years, right? Days, because when the sun comes up and goes down, we know it's been a day. Right. And for seasons, because, you know, as the sun changes its height in the sky and all of these things like the seasons change. Right. And for years, because we observe the sky. And this is what really boggles the mind of con the kids in confirmation. Right. That before there was calendars. People knew when a year had happened. Just by looking at the sky, they could figure it out. Right. And that's how we got to 365 days and all this kind of stuff. Right. And even it doesn't specifically mention months there, but the moon tells us how long a month is, right? So on the third day of creation, God makes this thing called time, right? It's a part of, it's, and, and we've lived, and human beings have lived in it ever since we've existed, right? We're not made till the sixth day of creation. But God exists, but the fact that God made time tells us that God exists outside of time. Before there was time, there was God. And after time is done, there will still be God, 
right? When we say, when we talk about eternity, that's what we mean, that, that God is eternal. He's outside of time. He's not ruled by clocks and years and days and whatever. He made those things. He's outside of all of that. So we, and this is what a long way getting back to what we're talking about here in the book, the humans live in time. We live in this creation where time is a reality, but God has destined us eventually to live outside of time, right? That this world and the time that rules over it is going to stop. There's going to be an end, but that's not going to be the end of us. That God has got a plan for us to continue to exist with him into eternity where there where time is no longer a thing okay and so screw tape screw tape says that's the reality he does, he's not arguing with that that's what jesus wants he wants us to be in eternity with him so he says what jesus wants or what screw tape thinks that jesus wants is for us human beings to chiefly pay attention to two things one to eternity to our eternal life and to that time that we call the present, to pay attention to our eternal life and to what's happening right here, right now. Does that make sense? Clear as mud? All right. Then screw tape says, and this is over onto the next page, I think. Yeah, next page. Screw tape says, our business, screw tape and wormwood and the devil and all of that is to get them away from the eternal, not thinking about that eternal life, and from the present, to get them away from thinking about the present also. If, that's, if Jesus wants us to be thinking about our eternal life and this particular present moment, the devil says, well, I want them thinking about anything else other than that. So I don't want them thinking about eternal life, and I don't want them thinking about right here, right now. And instead, he's got some other ideas uh, for what he wants us uh, to be thinking about. Thoughts, questions about any of that? One other question, or one other thing before we go on to the next thing. When, when Jesus wants us to be thinking about our eternal life, what do you think that means? What does he want us thinking about? Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Oops, I'm losing my glasses here. I like the way that it says it here on page. If you look, I didn't put this on the screen or on the slides here. I should have. Um, at the bottom of page 75 in the book, the last sentence, but it's a bit of a long sentence. So it's about, it's on the fourth line from the bottom. It says, he would therefore have them continually concerned either with eternity. And then he says exactly what that means, which means being concerned with him or with the present. And he goes on to talk about what that means to, to be focused on the present. But I think that's easier for us to wrap our brains around without an explanation. So what screw tape is telling us, what, what the devil is telling us, you could say, is that thinking about eternity means thinking about Jesus, right? And, and having our eyes fixed on Jesus because he's the one who gives us eternal life, right? That's what the disciples say to him one time when, when a bunch of other people walk away from Jesus because he says strange things about eating his body and drinking his blood. And they're like, well, that's crazy. I'm out of here. Jesus looks at his disciples says, you guys gonna leave too? And they say, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Right? We, we're with you. Okay? Their eyes are going to be fixed on Jesus uh, and, and the eternal life that they have in him. And so that's how it is for us too. Jesus would have us focused on eternity and on the present. And focusing on eternity means focusing on Jesus. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, if, we're, if the devil's got different ideas about that, we got to explore that a little bit. And there's two alternatives, like we've already said, to focusing on eternity and on the present. One is to be focused on the past, and the other is to be focused on the future. And we're going to want to make sure we distinguish between the, what we mean by the future and what we mean by eternity. But we'll talk about that here in a second. But first, we got to talk about living in the past. So screw tape says we, we want to keep him thinking about anything other than the present and eternity. And he says, on page 76, he says, with this in view, 
we sometimes tempt a human, say a widow or a scholar, to live in the past. First, first thing, what do you think it means by living in the past? What's living in the past? Yeah. 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 So, so, so living in the past can mean living in a made like living in a made up version of the past, right? My mind is constantly gone back to some other time, and I've got a I've got a rose colored glasses view of what that past time was like. I think we all do that to a certain extent, right? We look back at our past and we, we, we say, oh, it was so much better back when this was happening or when life was like this, right? But the truth is, right? Even when we were way back then, it's not like everything was perfect. It's not like we didn't have problems, but we tend to look back into the past with, like I said, rose colored glasses as if it was always all really good. And now we have problems, but then it was good, which is probably not at all actually true, right? It's just our, our imagination is kind of filling in the gaps and making everything seem good. So yeah, any other ideas? What does it mean to live in the past? Yeah. And a scholar is studying the past. Yeah. 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 No, and, and Elizabeth anticipated my next question here, right? So I'm up on the screen now. I've got why? Why do you think screw tape would use the example of a widow and a scholar? as people who might be tempted to live in the past. And I think, you, I think you're right on with that. For, for someone who is a widow, perhaps the, the past would be looking back to a, a time when, well, yeah, th their spouse was alive, right? And their family was more whole or complete than it is right now, per perhaps longing for that time to be back. Um, I, I especially think the farther you go back in history, the more true that would be. Like if you go back to Jesus's time, where being a widow was dangerous and you know not not good, really not good. Um, you, you were vulnerable as a result of being a widow. You might not even have food to eat. Um, though, then especially that person would be looking back into the past and longing for that time when life was simpler and easier. But even today, you know, we when we've lost someone we've loved, uh, we look back to that time and wish we could go back and live in that past time again. So I think, that, I think that's why the widow one is mentioned and scholars, I think Elizabeth is right on too. Um, I, when I read that, I thought of, so in, when I did my, my university degree before I went to seminary, I studied history. And uh, means you're, you're being taught by people who have spent most of their life studying history. And there's some of those people and, and university professors are sometimes some of the quirkiest people you're ever going to meet, right? They're incredibly intelligent, but their brains are in strange places all at the same time. Um, and there's some of those, those history professors that I had that you'd swear, you know, they don't, that they, you know, they live back in whatever time period they study, right? They really live in the 1700s, but they're all, they're alive here today. You know, their, their attention is so focused back on the past. But even then, it, there's this tendency to look back at the past and say, "Oh, a hundred years ago, the world was a better place. Two hundred years ago, it was a better place. Why couldn't we just go back and live in those days?" You know. And so there's always this this draw to look back into the past. Yes, I did hear about the them finding more Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah, and it, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls are these ancient documents that are found in some caves not too far from Jerusalem. Um, and what they're helpful for is they, 
They're not most, most of them are books of the Bible, copies that are 2000 essentially years old um, of books of the Bible, which help us to realize that no, the Bibles we have are actually pretty accurate because those ones say the exact same things that ours say, right? So for Christians, it's, a, it's an encouraging thing every time they find more of those. But yeah, speaking of the past and people studying the past, that is a, that is a thing. Mm -hmm. And I all of a sudden have a big job and earning lots of money. Mm -hmm. They keep thinking about how it used to be. Yeah. Keep working harder. Yeah, sure. Oh, that, that, and that's another way to think of it too. Yeah, there. When when the past was bad, it makes us live in a different way in the present as well, where we're not living for the sake of the present. We're living to avoid the past. Right. If the past has been bad, sometimes we end up living in a way where all of our focus is on avoiding repeating the past, right, or having the past happen again, in which case the past has taken over our lives and something else is going on. That's a good point, too. I hadn't thought of that. Why would why would living in the past from a spiritual perspective be detrimental or dangerous? Why or to put it another way, why doesn't Jesus want us to live in the past? What do you think? Yeah, it's gone forever. Yeah, yep. Yeah. It's it's just over. Yeah, and and so that that's kind of what I was thinking too. The past, of course, is a finished thing. It's complete. It's done. It's over. We'll talk about that again in just a second here. But if we're living in it still, this complete over past thing, there's a very real possibility we'll miss what's happening in front of us right here in the present. And I especially think of this as. You know, Jesus would have us love our neighbor as ourself. But if we're so busy living in the past, I mean, the past that's on this side is what I've been doing. The past is over here. Uh, if, if we're so busy living in the past, perhaps we won't even notice our neighbors in the present who need our, that we can love, right? And so I think there's that part of it. Any other ideas? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point too, right? God promises when he forgives our sins, he's, he tells us, you know, I will remember your sins no more. We have, but we have a real good way, or a real, a real, not a good way, a bad habit of remembering our own sins that God has forgotten, <laughs> right? It's, as if it's not good enough that God forgot those things. They're buried with Jesus and he's risen from the dead. So they're truly gone once and for all. Um, our, our sins are gone, dead and buried. But we like to kind of just dredge them back up again and think about them a little more or something like that. So I think, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point too. Mm, well, the two are, the, the two you can't take apart, right? The two are inextricably linked. Hmm. Oh, well, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's ever possible for us to talk too much about Jesus's death, right? Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, we pre preach Christ and him crucified, right? That's, now that includes the fact that he rose from the dead afterwards. I, I, I wouldn't say that we, we could possibly talk too much about what happened there on the cross. But yeah, I take your point that we also need to be talking about how he rose from the dead, because that's just as important. Right? The, the, two are, the two are two sides of the same coin, you could say it that way. Um, the other thing that I thought of is we have a tendency sometimes, I think, to think of what, of what Jesus has done for us as a past thing. And it is a past thing. 2,000 years ago, you know, Jesus was on the earth, lived, died, rose again. It all happened in time. And that time for us is in the past. But if we're, so, if we're only focused on what Jesus has done for us as a past thing, something that happened in history, we're neglecting the fact that, yes, he's risen from the dead and he's doing things right now, right? In particular, he's here among us to forgive our sins right now, right? When, when we're listening to uh, the, the scriptures read to us or when the pastor is preaching to us or when we're receiving Holy Communion or when someone's getting baptized, 
Jesus is doing these things. He's right here, right? We don't need to just think that Jesus is way back there in history. He's present right here among us because he is risen from the dead and he's promised that he will be with us always. So living in the past in, in that sense could be as if you know Jesus and everything he's done is just past action. And we thanks be to God that he did that. But now what are we gonna do? Well, well that's not quite right. Jesus is here among us. Um, doing all these things among us even now. Thoughts or questions about any of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I think I maybe have told this story before, but um, my grandfather, when he he was in his last year or two of life, got really like reflective on things and looked back at his life a lot. He spent a lot of time. He was in the Navy and he spent all this time thinking about what he used to do. And and a lot of ways he longed for the good old days. But then what also happened at a certain point is he stumbled across some mis mistakes that he had made in life and he would not let them go. He just, he, he drove my grandmother nuts because he sat there for days and days and days in his chair, complaining, of, not complaining, lamenting about what he had done, how he had messed up this and that and what, what the results had been. Until finally she had the pastor come over and the, he, my grandpa told all of this to the pastor and uh, this pastor knew what he was doing. So he, he, he was a good, he's a good one. Um, and he looked at my grandpa and says, why are you chasing after the garbage truck, right? Jesus has come and taken away your sin and you're chasing after the garbage truck, trying to get the garbage back, right? The garbage truck comes along, picks up your garbage, takes it away. It's not yours anymore. You don't ever need to worry about it again. But here you are running behind the truck after the, down the street, trying to get your garbage back. Let the garbage truck take it away. Let Jesus take your sins away. They're gone, right? But we have this habit of dwelling, like, this, like, and I think like Leah said, living in the past and trying to hold on to those mistakes that we've made, even though Jesus has taken those away. They're not ours anymore, so let's let it go. I know I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. The, the things pop back in my head all the time. So yeah, living in the past is a problem. Now, uh, there's a couple of Bible verses. The Bible doesn't actually say very much about living in the past. When we get to living in the future, the Bible has more to say about that and why we shouldn't do that. But about living in the past, the Bible doesn't say a ton about that, right? There's not, there's not so much. But I found a couple of things. The first one um, is from Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Now, Ecclesiastes is one of the books we have in the Old Testament that was written by Solomon. You know, Solomon was the king over Israel who prayed uh, and asked God to give him wisdom, right? And God gave him wisdom plus riches and honor and all kinds of other stuff. And he ruled over Israel for a long time. At the beginning or towards the beginning of Solomon's reign over Israel, he wrote the book of the Bible we call Proverbs, right? So we've got the book of Proverbs and the book of Proverbs, the point of it, Solomon says, is to teach us, is to teach young people wisdom. So Solomon says, God gave me this wisdom. I want to teach you what wisdom is. And so he sets out this whole book, Teaching Wisdom. Then later in Solomon's life, when things in the kingdom of, uh, kingdom of Israel haven't gone particularly well, Solomon has made a mess of things by marrying a whole bunch of foreign wives and worshiping false gods. And he's now an old guy who is not quite as enthusiastic or optimistic as he was as a young person. Then he writes the book of Ecclesiastes, right? And it sounds an awful lot like a book when you read it. It sounds an awful lot like a book written by um, almost a depressed individual, the book of Ecclesiastes. It's the book where it says, vanity of vanity, everything is vanity, or uselessness of uselessness, everything is useless, right? That, and he says, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything just keeps going around. It's always the same. Doesn't matter what you do. You're going to live. You're going to die. What difference, right? So that's what's when Solomon's an old guy, that's what he's thinking. Now, 
it's still God's word and there's still and there's there's truth to it, but it's a it's a more sober reflection of life when he's an old man. He's not maybe so optimistic as he was as a young guy. And, and he says here in Ecclesiastes chapter seven, this is what Solomon says. And that's a, 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 a drawing of Solomon as an old guy. You know, he, he doesn't look particularly happy there either, right? He's kind of, you know, anyways. But uh, this is what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter seven. He says, say not why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Like, so remember, Solomon's this guy who's got wisdom, wisdom from God. And he says, no, it's not a wise thing to, to look back at those former days and say that they were better than these ones. They weren't. <laughs> it's just our, it's like we said, our rose colored glasses looking back at the past saying, oh, it was really good back then. Now it's lousy. Well, no, back then had its problems too, right? So he says, it's not, that's not a wise thing to be doing is what he's telling us. But another Bible verse that I thought was kind of relevant here um, is from Luke chapter nine, and it's up on the screen here too. Um, and we're, we're gonna. This is. I usually try very hard not to take Bible verses out of context, but we're gonna take one a little bit out of context here because I think it it works. Um, so in Luke chapter nine, you've got a few people who come up to Jesus and say, "I will follow you," or something like that. And so this is, this is one of those people who comes up to Jesus and says that. So it says, yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. So he's not wanting to live in the past. That's why I say I'm taking this out of context a little bit. He just wants to go home and say goodbye to his family, which would seem like a reasonable thing. But Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God, right? And so it's that idea of looking back, I think that ties into this living in the past thing, right? That's not what this man that came to Jesus was doing, but I think the same principle applies. If you I got, a, I found a picture there of a guy plowing a field, he's not looking back, he's doing a very good job. But if he were to look back, what is likely to happen is that plow is gonna start to turn and his nice clean line that he's been drawing there is going to start to veer off either to the left or the right, depending on which way he looked back, right? Which shoulder he looks over, right? It's the, it, so that's what Jesus is saying. If we're, if we're looking back, then we're not following Jesus on the narrow way. Our eyes aren't on Jesus who was going before us. Our eyes are back on whatever happened back there, and we're going to swerve off to one side or the other. The other way to think about it is the Bible regularly describes um, our lives of faith as a race, right? It says, let us run with endurance the race that has been set before us. Well, if you try to run a race looking backwards, A, you're never going to get very far, and B, you're probably going to run into someone or something, right? It's going to, the result's not going to be good. So the, the point is the same. We're, we're, we're not to be looking backwards, but to be looking forwards, and not just to the future, but as we've already said, to eternity, to eternal life, to Jesus, right? Thoughts, questions about that? Yeah. 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 Um, what you want to do in your will is not what I want you to do. My will is that you come home, do what I want you to do in this moment for, for the kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus is calling us to follow him, have our eyes fixed on him and 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 live in this present moment as he's as he's called us. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's, well, but we don't want to spend the whole time talking about the past here because screw tape has a lot more to say about the future. Uh, so wrapping up the past, he says, but this, getting them to live in the past, is of limited value, for they have some real knowledge of the past, and it has a determinate nature, and to that extent, resembles eternity. It is far better to make them live in the future. Now, this is a really interesting point that I want to just think about here for a second. 
Screw tape says that the past resembles eternity. Okay, remember, we got these four things we're dealing with here, past, present, future, eternity. And he says the past has some similarity to eternity. And what he says is, is that it has this, that this similarity to eternity because it has this, well, he says, determinate nature, which by which he means it's to somewhat, it's, it's been determined. Remember what we said about the past earlier, it's over, it's done, it's completed, it's finished, right? There's no changing it. There's nothing that needs to, we need to go back and do, it's done, okay? And he says, screw tape does here, that there's something about that that is like eternity, that eternity is done and decided and completed too. I had to puzzle over what in the world that could possibly mean, but the best explanation for it, I think, is that our eternal life with Jesus is a decided reality. What does Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. There's eternity for you, right? It's not, it's not up in the air. It's not like, hmm, I sure hope this works out. It's, it is finished. It is done. It is complete, right? So in that sense, eternity resembles the past. The past is finished and complete, and so is our hope for eternity because it is finished because Jesus died and rose again and gives eternal life to everyone who believes in him. So we can be just as confident about eternity as we are about the past because they're both finished. Make sense? There's a lot of comfort in that, I think. Okay, but screw tape says rather than getting them live in the past, it's much better to get them live in the future. So let's, let's talk about what that looks like. So before we... Before we dig into that, what do you think it means living in the future? Yeah, have our, uh, yeah. yeah, having our attention constantly focused on what we're going to do in a year or in a month, in a week, or even tomorrow. We'll talk about tomorrow here in just a second. But it's, it's constantly having our eyes fixed on whatever's whatever we hope is going to happen, whatever we think might happen, whatever we're afraid might happen, right? And always thinking about what might be somewhere down the road. Remember, we're not talking about eternity here. Eternity is beyond the future even, but, but you know, the next day, the next month, the next year, the next 10 years, whatever it might be. Why is, why is living that way, living in the future, maybe spiritually dangerous or detrimental? Or again, to put it another way, why doesn't Jesus want us to live that way? Why do you think? Anxieties and fears. That's one side of the coin. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Grateful for the blessings that you're enjoying right now. Yeah, yeah. So that you can work on yep. helping others and such. You can't focus on others when you're constantly dreaming about what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. At some point in the future. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The mind can create uh, all sorts of fantasies about future and all kinds of realities about yep. the future that never come, come, come to be. Yeah. Yeah. So, so screw tape get we're we're headed in the right direction in our thinking here. And and screw tape will kind of give us a little more information here. On page 76 in the book, uh, he says biological necessity makes all their passions point in that direction already. So he's like, just the fact that we need to stay alive. That's what he means by biological necessity. So to a certain extent, and we'll talk about this again in just a second. To a certain extent, we need to think about the future because otherwise we might not have what we need to keep us alive tomorrow, right? There is a certain extent to which we need to think about the future. So he says, biological necessity makes their passions point in that direction already. So that thought about the future inflames, and there's two things here, hope and fear. Also, it is unknown to them so that in making them think about it, we make them think of unrealities. But, 
the first thing is this, this, uh, this hope and fear. So thinking about the future can result in two different things. You know, Kathleen's first example was, you know, next year going to Cuba, right? That's a future hope. It's not a bad hope. It's not sinful even to think about that or to plan a vacation or any of those kinds of things. None of those things are wrong. But, but thinking living in the future is, is constantly creating these hopes which we have no idea whether that's actually going to be able to happen. And if this past year hasn't taught us that lesson, then I don't know what it's, when it, how we're ever going to learn it. That we can plan all we want and, you know, book all the flights that we want <laughs> and a, a, little, a, a little virus shows up and they're all gone, right? It's just, it's just the way that it goes, right? So, we, so living in the future sets up hopes, which are fine, but, the, but when our hopes get dashed, right, then we become despondent over what's happened to us and how miserable our suffering is or something like that. So living in the future builds up these hopes, but the, the other side of that is living in the future builds up fear. And again, just look around the world and we see this happening too. What we don't know. Or, you know, the, the last couple of days in the, in the newspaper, they've been speculating about a third wave. You know, what's it going to be? What's the next week, month, year going to look like? How, you know, all this kind of stuff. So living, we can spend so much time living in the future that these hopes for the future and these fears about the future just totally consume us. But, as, and as Srute points out here, we don't know the future. So we don't know if any of that's going to happen. And we're living in an unreal world then of just pure speculation, which doesn't do us any good. Yeah? The other thing that hope does is it can make us discontent in the present. Yeah. So using that same example, in the world that we live in right now, we might look forward to a year from now going to Cuba because right now we can't do anything. And we get so focused on going to Cuba and enjoying the sunshine that right now just sucks even more. Yeah, and we're miserable. And we sit exactly. here and be miserable in the present because it's not the future. Yeah. Well, it's just, <laughs> welcome to life. That's how rather, it is. Rather than focusing on still the good things that are happening yeah. and the new things that we can. Yeah, and, I, and to Elizabeth's point earlier, I think living in what, what Jesus would have us do, and we'll get to this here in a second, is live in the present be thankful for the blessings we have right now, rather than speculating about the blessings we might have next year. And praying for God to help us with the troubles that we have right now, rather than worrying about what the troubles might be next year, right? Because we've got troubles already now, right? That's the other side of that too. And this is what Jesus is going to tell us here. So we got to open up our Bibles this time. It's too much to put on the screen. Uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, we're looking for verse 31 to start with and reading down to 34. This is the Sermon on the Mount again. I'm amazed how many times as I work my way through this book and think about what the what Bible verses relate to what Lewis says here in this book, how often it ties into the Sermon on the Mount. We've come back to this well about, I don't know how many times already, and we'll be back here again a few times, a few times more. Um, so we're going to read Matthew chapter 6 here, verse 31 down to verse uh, 34. Irma, I guess we are around the table to you. So could you read that for us? Okay, this verse right here is what this whole chapter is all about. The whole chapter is taking what Jesus says here and expanding on it. What, is, what does Jesus teach us here about living in the future? What does he say about living in the future here? It's mostly verse 34 at the end. 
Well, yeah, there's this promise that the, the future is going to take care of itself. So Jesus, so he says here at the end in verse 34, don't worry about tomorrow, right? For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So that's the first thing we said. Like we, we can spend so much time worrying about the trouble maybe of tomorrow or a year from now or whatever. Jesus is, Jesus is being honest with us here and recognizing the fact that each day we've got enough trouble all on its own. We don't need to worry about tomorrow's trouble because today has got plenty. Jesus isn't saying that your life is perfect and you have nothing to worry about. No, Jesus is admitting that in this world, we're going to have trouble and there's going to be things that we worry about. But he's telling us not to worry about things on down the line. Just worry about today. Get through, you know, pay attention to today. Because there's enough. And, and when it says here, each day has enough trouble of its own. Trouble is putting it mildly. What Jesus really said is each day has enough evil of its own, right? Like the devil and the world and our own sinful nature are here with us in the present there's plenty for us to deal with right now. Let's stop worrying about the future, okay? But then, th then there's Elizabeth's point here. Jesus makes us a promise here and how the future is going to take care of itself. Instead of worrying about the future, what does Jesus encourage us to do here? This is in the previous verse, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. So Jesus, in, in, in other words, live your life focused on eternity. The kingdom of God, eternity, which is here in the world right now. Jesus, in being born, living, dying, rising again, creating, you know, establishing his church on earth. His kingdom is here, so it's in the present as well. But in particular, the kingdom is focused on eternity. And so Jesus is telling us here to focus our eyes on eternity, on him. And what do we need to have eternal life? His righteousness, not ours, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. All these things that you're worried about will be taken care of. The future will be taken care of. Focus your attention on the present, yes, but especially on the kingdom of God and the righteousness that Jesus is giving to you, so that, or has given to you, so that you can live with him in his kingdom forever. And all these other things will be added unto you, will be taken care of. All right, I got another one for us to look at here. Um, Luke chapter 12. Oh, another one of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Yep. Yeah, and, and down to twenty one, sorry. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. Okay. In what ways is this guy living in the future? He's storing up things that he doesn't need that he may not even that he may not even need. Yeah, he's got he's got in the present, he's got an abundant crop, which Jesus makes a point of telling us he didn't do anything to get an abundant crop. It says um, in verse 16, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. So it's not like the farmer did a great job farming that particular year and it produced a good crop. Jesus' point is no, the ground made this. Like it just grew, okay? So it's not like he earned it. 
but he's got in the present, he's got a bumper crop. He's got all kinds of grain. He doesn't know what to do with it. And so he, the decision that he makes here is with an eye to the future, right? Build this second barn, to, well, tear down his old barn, build a new one, and then a bigger one that can hold all of the grain that he has now. And then I'll be able to, you know, to, I'll have enough good things to be laid up for many years and I can eat, drink and be merry and ha take it easy. And of course, you know, it, it doesn't work out for him because that, that night his life is required of him. He dies and he never gets to enjoy the abundance that he has, right? The danger here of living in the future is that we just live in this kind of selfish kind of way that's entirely focused on our own future and our own well-being and our own this, that, and everything else. Yeah, it's like people hoarding toilet paper. Yeah, but they're doing that because of fear, not because of hope. This guy's doing it because of hope, right? People were doing that because they were afraid of not having toilet paper. Yeah. And coming back to the book here for a second, and I, because I think this quote, this is what it directly relates to this parable that Jesus told. Um, he, Jesus, does not want men to give the future their hearts, to place their treasure in it. We do, screw tape and wormwood, we do. Jesus doesn't want us living our lives right now for the sake of the future. And this, you know, and I, I don't, I want to say this the right way without disparaging people with this profession in any kind of way. This is my complaint about um, investment bankers and, and financial people, financial planners and people like that, whose entire life and purpose is to help you or is to convince you not to live for the present, but to live entirely for the future so that you can retire comfortably and perhaps retire early, right? There's this whole industry in the world today of convincing people. And you just got to watch TV and you see the commercials for, you know, Edward Jones or all these different financial institutions that put out before you, you know, look, look at this happy couple who's, they're only 60 and they're retired and they've got a big house and or a big cottage or da, 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 da. They're playing with their grandkids. Look at how wonderful their life is. If you do, if you follow our instructions, you can be like them, Right. And they, they're trying to get you to put your treasure in the future, right? Now, I'm not saying that people shouldn't invest for their retirement. I invest for my retirement. It's a good thing to do. I want to be able to retire someday. But if that becomes the be all and the end all, and for a lot of people it does, then we've put our treasure in the wrong spot. And that's not where Jesus, and we're, we've just become the guy in the parable. And who knows if we're going to live long enough to enjoy everything that we saved. I'm, I, for many of you, that's not in the relevant context for you in life, but it is for a lot of people and people my age in particular. Oh, and this is a great quote too, page 78 in the book. Screw tape says, we want a whole race, that is the human race, perpetually in pursuit of the rainbow's end, which you never get to, by the way, right? I don't know if you've ever tried to go to the end of a rainbow. It's just not possible. The rainbow keeps moving. Anyways. We want a whole race perpetually in pursuit of the rainbow's end, never honest, nor kind, nor happy now, but always using as mere fuel wherewith to heap the altar of the future, every real gift which is offered them in the present. In other words, screw tape says, we want them to use every gift, every blessing that is given them to them right now for the future. Get them to just store it all up for the future and use it all for the future. And like he says, you burn it as fuel at the altar of the future, worshiping the future so that everything in our lives revolves around what's going to happen in the future. This is what Screw Tape and Wormwood are aiming at and taken straight. And it, it, anyways, I'm not going to say any more about investment bankers. I could go on for a while. And instead he gives us, this is what Jesus's ideal is. Page seven, this goes back a page, page 77. His ideal is a man who, having worked all day for the good of posterity, washes his mind of the whole subject, commits the issue to heaven, and returns at once, you shouldn't say once, it's just once, 
to the patience or gratitude demanded by the moment that is passing over him. So this is, you know, this is screw tape saying this is what Jesus wants. Jesus wants a person who, yes, works all day for the good of posterity, means the, the good of his children in the future and his, good of his own self in the future. Sure, work all day for that good. That's not a wrong thing. But then at the end of the day, he says, this person washes their mind of that subject of the future, doesn't worry about it anymore, commits it to heaven, says, Jesus, take care of this, take care of my kids, take care of myself in retirement or whatever else, and returns at once, not to thinking about the future, but to the patience to endure the present troubles and the gratitude to be thankful for present blessings that are passing over right now, right? The focus on that, that present living. One more quote here. To be sure, the enemy wants men to think of the future too. Jesus wants us to think about the future. We said that already. If we don't, well, then we won't be prepared for some very real, you know, some, for some things that could happen to us that we should be prepared for. We might not have what we need to live, stuff like that. So to be sure, the enemy, Jesus wants men to think about the future too. Just so much as is necessary for now, planning the acts of justice and charity, which will probably be their duty tomorrow. So he says, yeah, Jesus needs, wants them to think about the future too, but only so much so that they can be prepared to love their neighbor as their self tomorrow, just like today. That's good thinking about the future. Thoughts or questions about any of that? I've got just one more thing here before we, uh, before we wrap it up. Two more Bible verses for us to look at. Because what we've, we've said already is Jesus is, what Jesus has set out for us here in Matthew chapter six, for example, is that we live in the present with our eye on eternity, on our eternal life. And so there's two verses I want us to look up about that. The first one is 2 Thessalonians chapter three. 2 Thessalonians comes right after 1 Thessalonians, in case you were wondering, uh, but it's right before 1 Timothy. So it's between 1 Thessalonians and Timothy. And if you've got the same Bible as me, that's page 1,844. If you don't, well, almost none of you do. So got a different one there. First, or 2 Thessalonians, sorry, chapter 3. We want to read verse 6 down to verse 12. Um, if you've got the same one as me, is it, do you have one of these ones? Okay, 1,844. Oh, that's, that's small print though, right? Yeah, different page numbers. I've got the large print one over here. Okay, 2 Thessalonians, that's good. Chapter 3, verses 6 to 12. Okay. What is the problem that Paul is addressing here in this chunk of his letter to the Thessalonians? Idleness. Idleness. The people are not working. They're not doing anything. They're not earning their food. They're, they're not earning their living. They seem to be relying on charity of some kind. This is not because they're not able to work, right? 
this is, the, this is a verse we have to be careful with. There are plenty of people in the world who are unable to work, and this is not applying to them that they need to, you know, straighten up and just get down to work or whatever else for whatever reason they can. That that's not the that's not the case here. It doesn't tell us why these people aren't working, but one of the guesses that people that Bible scholars have suggested, and I think it's probably an accurate guess, uh, is that these people think that the world is going to end, eternity is going to come any minute, and so there's no reason for us to work, right? No point going to work if Jesus is coming back tomorrow, right? The reason they, we wonder if that's what's going on is in his previous letter, Paul wrote extensively to them about the coming of our Lord Jesus. And so maybe they've taken that a bit too far and have stopped working. Okay. What, and, and so in response to that, Paul says, no, get to work, right? Live your life. You don't know when Jesus is coming again. Live your life, work. So the, the point here is we wrap this up for today. Jesus wants us to have, and we got one more after this, so we're not quite done yet. But Jesus wants us to live in the present with our eyes focused on eternity at the same time. If our eyes get too focused on eternity, we forget about the present. And this is a case in point of that and stop living our lives and working and doing what God has given us to do, whatever that happens to be for us in our place in life. Uh, and that's a problem. So Paul directs us back to, no, we've got to pay attention to the present, live in the present, do what we need to do in the present. And then in another one of his letters, he gives us the other side of the coin. So Philippians chapter three, that's back towards the front of the Bible, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, right before Colossians. Philippians chapter three, seventeen to twenty-one are the verses that we're looking at this time. Last paragraph of chapter three. Joan, are you able to read that one for us? Okay. Mm -hmm. of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power and that enables, enables him to bring everything under his control and will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. All right. So first of all, just as uh, this is an interesting point. In both of these readings that we just read, Paul looks Paul says join in imitating me. So in the first one, he said imitate me by working hard. Okay? By doing your work. And then in this one he says imitate me by doing what? What is he warning them against? Or what is he? Yeah, well, he, he, he says, uh, where is it here? Verse 19, he's talking about, well, 18 and 19. He says, they're these people who live as enemies of the cross of Christ. He says, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things these people are living too much in the present right they've lost sight of eternity altogether they're only caring they're only caring about what they can fill their bellies with and what can make them happy and feel good right here right now so paul says all same thing join in imitating me not living that way but keeping in mind that our citizenship is in heaven or eternity Right? And from it, we eagerly await a Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to subdue all things or put all things under his control, will raise our bodies from the dead, give us eternal life, and will cause us to live with him there in eternity. So Paul here 
directs us to put our eyes on Jesus and the eternal life that we have with him in our resurrected bodies on the last day. So there's this dual, two sides of the same thing, living our lives in the present, doing the work that God's given us to do, and fixing our eyes on Jesus, looking forward to the eternal life, the resurrection of the body, to the hope that we have in Christ. Put a bow on it. Thoughts, questions, anything like that? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you have given us great and glorious hope for eternal life with you uh, when our bodies are raised from the dead and we dwell with you in life everlasting. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, to focus our attention on him, and live lives that are focused on that hope that we have, but also help us to live in the present moment with our eyes fixed on that which you've placed around us and the opportunities that we have to love one another and serve you. Help us not to dwell in the past or to uh, live lives filled with um, undue worry and fear about the future, but fix our eyes on Jesus and our hope in him. We pray this all in his holy name. Amen.